So wow, that was such an introduction, man. Um, yeah, well, uh, first of all, like say thanks to the organization for giving me the chance to be here, um, like Poland. Um, even though I don't look probably like a big Polish uh, user interface, um, my grandpa is Polish, so I don't speak Polish, unfortunately. But yeah, have this special love for your country then. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, thanks for coming to my talk here. Um, I'll be talking about uh, specific experiences and things that I came across uh, regarding big mobile code bases. Of course, all these practices can be applied to any software development uh, project. Um, this is a reloaded edition, uh, so I've been collecting feedback. It's not the first time I give this talk. Um, something that I like to to always say is like, Please interrupt me whenever you want to uh, ask anything. We don't need to go or wait until the Q&A session. Um, a quick introduction. Uh, well, no more than what my friend Alex said. Uh, yeah, so I'm basically a curious learner, software engineer, speaker. Uh, I work at SoundCloud, uh, which is a music platform. I'm not going to talk much about it, because uh, I guess many of you uh, know it, and if, if you don't, uh, all the samples and the experiences here are going to be related to my company, so um, yeah, you will get to know it. Um, I have a blog too. Um, I try to maintain it, maintain it. Sometimes it's a bit hard, it requires time, but I try to do my best. Then. Um, so basically, um, I like to start with a little story. Um, I usually speak when I have something to say. Um, and especially, you know, when you have a big mobile code base, um, everything start in a s at a small scale, I would say, right? Uh, we don't have like big, big mobile uh, code base in the beginning, right? So what happens? Um, let's say we have, we are developers. Most of the time we start with our own pet projects. Um, you're happy, you start hacking it up at home. And then, um, yeah, this project becomes cool. You, you make your own decisions. You don't have to do anything. You know, you don't have to, like, I don't know, have meetings because you make, you're the only maintainer of this project. Um, so that's what I call, like, one-man development process model. It's yourself, it's me, you, whatever. Uh, you have your GitHub repo there, and you start working on that. Uh, but what happens then? Um, at some point in time, you start to be successful, or you know, some people start using your um, your project. It starts to grow, and of course, like that comes with the price. More features required. Uh, you start collecting feedback from users using your app, and you're very happy for it, and you're like that. It's it's awesome because you start. Oh my God, man. Uh, some some people are using my app then. But uh, that's the first problem, actually, success. And of course, it's a good problem to solve, but still a problem. Uh, these are real numbers uh, at SoundCloud. So nowadays, we have uh, more than 100,000 installs on both platforms. And this data was collected like, I don't know, a month ago, more or less. So you can imagine how big our code is uh, over user base, and when you screw it up, you screw it up at a big scale, too, right? Um, let me put a funny story. Um, it was my first week at SoundCloud, and I took care of the release, right? Um, and I didn't know much, you know, you need some time to onboard on a big code base, on the process, and so forth. And um, and back in the days, we didn't have like a very mature continuous integration environment. So most of the process was manual. And you know, we were serving a lot of users within our Android app and iOS. I started as an Android developer. Then I will tell you what I'm doing now. But um, I remember like before shipping uh, a release version of the app, you had to manually change the endpoint to point to production the API. So basically what happened, I forgot to do that. 
and <laughs> we were pointing to our dev version of our mobile API, which consisted in two machines, two Pentiums, something, serving 100 million users. So at some point, I was just like, well, I just shipped my version, super happy. And then for some reason, I went running and started using the app. So it was not playing any <laughs> anything. And I got a call from pretty much the CEO of the company saying, like, I think the app is not working. I was told that you were the release captain for this. You can imagine my, my face when you see that. So in the end, that's a big problem. Like when you are successful and you're screwing up things, it's like you really screw it up in, at a big scale. Because uh, I don't know how many users were not able to play uh, songs. And it's our core, basically. So the thing is, uh, what happens uh, when you're successful then? Again, bigger code base. It's very likely that you don't have tests, because we don't write tests most of the time when we're hacking up our apps. Uh, let me ask a question then. How many of you write tests here? All right. Polish, yeah. Plus one for Poland. <laughs> um, all right. But even in your uh, pet projects? All right. <laughs> that changes the game then. Um, well, the thing is, like, it's very likely that you don't have any tests. And, and you might run into certain inconsistency across your code base because you're trying stuff, right? You see, all right, in this screen, I'm going to do this pattern, or I'm going to try something new, or whatever. So that brings a lot of problems, right? So at some point, it's just like, all right, this is not working. I need to introduce more features, and it's taking longer. And we come up with an unsustainable situation. And I, I will tell you why. You require more features. More contributors come into play, basically. You cannot do everything yourself. Um, time to market. If you're you know, uh, running into this situation of success, then time to market becomes like super important. It, and it's a key point in your business. And of course, like complexity. That's the most important part. I mean, your code base starts to be more and more complex. So there's a bunch of questions that need an answer then, which are, is it easy to add a new functionality to the app? Imagine more people contributing. Uh, you need to onboard new people. Is it easy to add a new functionality? Can you scale that code base? And what about maintenance? Um, because you can add uh, features, maybe fast, because you're, you say like you just copy a bunch of code, it's paste it here. But then at some point, what you're doing there is buying some time. And technical depth, I mean, while doing copy-paste uh, driven development, it's like at some point, you're going to run into a lot of technical depth. And I can give you, uh, I'm going to give you some examples here. And so the thing is, how can we tackle all these problems? How can we address them? And, and what happens when we need to onboard new people, too? For example, at SoundCloud now, we're, um, I don't know, two or three new people every month. Uh, we are currently 20 Android developers contributing full day to our code base, plus another 20 committers from other teams. So you can imagine how much code is being generated for one code base. Um, and when you need to onboard new people, I mean, you need to be prepared for that. So um, I want to introduce a bunch of facts that I want you to keep in mind. Um, it's pretty hard to like to learn a lot in 45 minutes, but I just want to wake up your curiosity and then ask questions. And the first thing I want to introduce here is like, if your code is hard to work with, just change it. We need to re-architecture our apps. We need to change the way we think um, all the time. And uh, at SoundCloud, we have talked so many times about how to uh, we migrated from being a monolith application to a microservice architecture. I'm not going to deep dive here into it. Um, but uh, this is about evolution in the end. And it's the same. Um, nowadays, mobile code bases are as complex as 
many backends and code bases. I'm going to show you a tool here um, so you can see um, how much code base evolves. Uh, yeah, so wait, hold on a second. It's pretty cool actually. Let's see if this works. So, um, right, demo effect should work. Okay, cool. So, what is this? Let me see if I can make it bigger. So, basically, uh, this is our repo evolution. So, you can see one committer. John was the first committer. And those are the files. And you know, so then someone new jumped on board. You can see like two people committing different files, and um, it's very interesting. And this, I mean, with this tool, I'm gonna give it, give it to you on this here. Yeah. So this is 2011, but I can go further. Or I can go, let's say, here, and you see more people contributing to the code base. And even if I and the thing is, like, um, if you don't have consistency, for example, across your code base, how can you maintain it? How can you add more functionalities? This tool is pretty, is very useful for seeing, you know, the big picture of your code base and how it has evolved over the time. And um, you can actually put your your own pictures there and see uh, where the most committed files and the modified ones, um, and it's pretty interesting. I also recommend like, to read um, a book which is called um, Code as a Crime Scene or something like that. And it's about like this you know, analysis of your code base. This is very interesting. Man. Um, the tool is, cool, is called GURS. It's the same as source, but with G. Um, I definitely encourage you. It's an open source project. Um, so I definitely encourage you to just have a look, just out of curiosity, to see how you guys have been working on your code base over the time. Um, yeah, so yeah, I need to turn this off. Uh, cool. Now let's get back to the presentation then. OK. Yeah. So that's um, something uh, that I wanted to show. So the thing, the question is, what can we do in terms of code base, team organization, working culture, and processes? The thing is, like for me, when you're scaling a code base, it's not only about the code itself, because you need there is a lot of moving parts around your code base, and you can be the best developer and the best technical person, but in the end, if you don't have a good pro, if you don't have good processes behind, I don't know, releasing, onboarding people, uh, if you don't have a working culture or a team organization that fits within your uh, code base, you're not going to go anywhere in the end. Um, you can have the best uh, developers, but if you don't work in harmony, then uh, it's very difficult to scale. Uh, something that uh, I like to say, of course, I keep in mind that there are no silver bullets. Um, all these things uh, come from experiences. And, uh, and we have a bunch of enemies, of course, when working with big code mobile code bases. The first one is a size. I just put um, what we have here. I mean, on Android, uh, the DEX uh, method count is no longer a problem, even though it was solved by doing a hack. Uh, but uh, you know, keep in mind, these are numbers, real numbers as well, of our Android app. And this was a couple of months ago. So 20 developers contributing to our code base every day. So that, you know, goes up like very fast. Uh, complexity. Uh, it's not about here paying attention to the details of the code. But basically, uh, this is this code, uh, what it does is I go through a red black tree and try to find a specific node. But what I'm saying here, one of these enemies is complexity. So whenever you have complexity, you have to encapsulate it there and make it readable. If you just say, uh, if you don't encapsulate complexity, then it's going to be harder to read. Um, flaky tests. We have a lot of flakiness. Uh, you know acceptance tests and UI tests. Do you guys have uh, acceptance tests and UI tests on your continuous integration environment? 
Yeah? Yeah? Oh, no? Okay. Cool. Uh, you should definitely do it. But you, you will start fighting against uh, flakiness because by nature, UI tests are flaky. Um, basically because of other conditions, like let's say network conditions or other things. So basically we have someone we call the sheriff. So the sheriff in our team is a person, it's a role that we change every week. And it's main, it's main or her, na her main responsibility is to take care of acceptance tests. So this is a Slack message that we see every day with the most flaky tests that we have. And we have something, we count the failures, and then we try to come up to a solution to reduce flakiness in our code base. Definitely, you need a, a really good um, test battery in order to cover the main features of your app, at least. Uh, especially since there is so many uh, people committing to your code base. You don't want to break things like so easy. Um, anti patterns. This is something really important too. We have anti patterns. Uh, we have uh, bumped into, I don't know, complicated areas in our code uh, where we're definitely using or, you know, anti patterns. In this case, just this is part of our code. And as you can see, we are using somewhere. I just was typing and say, all right, I'm going to try to find async tasks in our code base. And actually, there is one. We're using, for me, nowadays, I mean, there's no reason why we should be using async tasks. Um, I think for me, it's an anti-pattern. This is, of course, it's very opinionated, but I think 90-something percent of people will agree with me because it's very coupled to your UI and so forth. So this is anti-pattern for me. Other thing that um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of a lava anti-pattern. A lava anti-pattern means um, having, let's say, uh, different ways in your code to do the same thing, right? That happens. You know, someone new comes, jumps on board, and you say, all right, um, so I'm going to do this uh, request. And then that person. Um, Say, all right, I'm going to look in, into this feature because it's been done this way here. And, and then the other person, no, but that's wrong because you can check the other feature, which is, was done differently there. And you, you bump into all this you know, endless loop that you, know, you have like so many things, so many ways of doing the same request. So that's something that we, we are trying to address, and I will tell you how. Uh, technical depth. Um, we have a process to tackle technical debt. Technical debt is something we cannot predict the future, so it's going to happen sooner or later. We are writing code today, uh, time uh, features and new features and new things, you know, are brought to our app. So we definitely are writing legacy code. <laughs> um, well, at least code that is going to be legacy sooner. And so you need to tackle this problem. And the thing is that how? how we can conquer a big mobile code base. Fact number two, architecture. I, I've talked so many times about architecture, and I think now it's a thing uh, here. <coughs> and um, definitely, we need to, to re-architect our apps, um, because new requirements require a new architecture. Uh, when you scale, um, you need to create frameworks around your app. You need to restructure things. So you need a new architecture. But the thing is, um, and this is actually a phrase, pick an architecture and stick to it. Um, basically, this is a copy and paste of uh, Romain Peel's uh, talk uh, in France, I think. He said these literal words, and I completely agree with it. It doesn't matter which kind of architecture uh, you'll be um, picking, but just stick to it. There's a, you have a bunch of options there. There are no silver bullets. You have onion layers. You have clean architecture, which I've talked or written about it like so many times. Uh, ports and adapter, whatever. Model view presenter, pure model view presenter. Combination, why not? I mean, could be the most uh, flexible. Uh, your own, of course. I mean, we have something at SoundCloud we are using uh, not a pure clean architecture approach, but something that we call Spoker. Uh, I don't know what that means, but someone just came up with that name. It sounded cool. 
Um, it's pretty much very close to clean architecture, but with different naming. So uh, we we s yeah we stick to it. Um, basically, rather than having I don't know use cases, we have operations. Let's say so things like that. And um, and sacrificial architecture. Why not? I mean, this is a concept that was introduced by Martin Fowler, which means that you're gonna come up with some architecture that you're gonna throw away. It's basically we're using that for prototyping, right? It doesn't make any sense to just like invest a lot of time for a feature that you never know uh, if you're gonna ship. Um, so what are the benefits then? You have a rapid development because your code base is prepared to scale. I mean, you have uh, strict rules that everyone should follow, and um, and that provides you a lot of uh, flexibility and, and, and rapid development. Good scalability, of course. Um, sometimes it, it like when I was um, I have an example of clean architecture, and someone or many people said, "Yeah, and my example was very um, or is very simple, right? It's just a list, and then you just click on a list, and it takes you to the details." And some people say, "All right, yeah, but man, that's super complex. Um, I mean, I wouldn't do that. All the, those wire app or that wire app, just for for the sake of having a list and a details view." Yeah, of course, I wouldn't do that either. But then you need to have strict rules when you're working with many people. And you need to define an architecture. Uh, and consistency, of course, that's what we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, being consistent is like one of the most important part of your code base. You should, be, uh, you should be able to jump into another features and and get familiar with how the code looks like. Um, and this is basically the big picture on how we, um, let's say, of our mobile ecosystem at SoundCloud. Uh, we have something that we call uh, BFFs, which are the, mo the APIs. So we have two, one for the web and the other one for, uh, for mobile clients. We have the clients, of course, here iOS, Android, and web. Since the requirements for each platform are different, so we decided to split up our API into mobile and web, which makes sense. Um, there's also some efforts on doing something with GraphSQL, too. And we have our microservice architecture. So basically, our mobile API, it's, um, it basically it consumes the microservices in a reactive way, so we compose all the, mi the data coming from the microservices into a JSON response, and we just spit it out to the clients. Um, but before this, I mean, we had, it was like super messy. It was super tough, and we needed to invest a lot of time on restructuring and, and modifying our, our approach. Um, so this is, again, uh, it's not about the details of the code, but this is an activity nowadays in our code base. As you can see, it's like there's nothing, pretty much like few lines of code, and that's it. We're just running away of the framework. We're encapsulating things. We are having our good architecture, and like whenever you come up with this code, it's like super easy to read. Um, this is a fragment, as you can see again. It's like very, when we need to do specific things related, we just rely on, on these two classes. Otherwise, we just encapsulate everything into other classes. Uh, for, you know, the stability and so forth. And uh, fact number three, evolution. So how you evolve your code base. You need to refactor all the time. Um, I'll be curious then, you know, after the talk, to listen to your experiences refactoring and, and tackling technical depth, um, because uh, we are still struggling with that. I mean, our code base is not perfect, not even close to that, but uh, we are constantly trying to get better at it. Uh, we explore new technologies. Um, back in the days, we bet on Rx Java 1. And you can imagine our code base, it's polluted with Rx Java 1. I mean, Rx Java 1 is all over the place. So what happens now? Um, I'm part of a core team, core engineering, um, which means that uh, we address everything that is cross-cutting concern within our clients, let's say things that affect the entire application. So Rx Java is something that falls into my backlog. And what happens? I am now I'm 
migrate into Rx Java 2. And how do I do that? Um, basically, I have both Rx Java versions working together, but we are exploring constantly new technologies. We, are, we need to be up to date. Um, yeah, and taking new approaches. In this case, uh, let me tell you the story um, how we are addressing Rx Java 2. Then basically what we are doing is like, let's just pick a functionality end to end. We just migrate it as a core uh, engineering team. And once we have that functionality end to end, uh, then it's when we showcase it to the team. And then we all together as good scouts, uh, we refactor it and gradually we migrate to it. Um, yeah, that's actually what I was uh, mentioning. Uh, be a boy scout, be a good boy scout all the time. Whenever you feel you see something that needs a refactoring, just go for it. Don't don't just like buy more time and say, all right, I'm going to copy paste this. this is, it works. I know that sometimes, um, you know, from product, they say, all right, you need to be fast. And you think that that's the better, best way of doing things. But in the end, uh, sooner or later, you're going to like hit your head uh, against a brick wall. Um, and do it all these baby steps. And this is especially because we are having a lot of code. And um, you can imagine if I would send like a PR of 10,000 lines of code. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, we have a restriction with that. And we don't accept PRs bigger than 500 lines of code because otherwise it's, it's you cannot review, right? I mean, you kind of, if you, I mean, if you send a PR of 10 lines of code, everyone is going to find issues, right? I mean, and many issues. But if you send a 2,000 lines of code PR, no one is going to find anything. All right, it was nice. And that always happens. <laughs> and so that's why we, we came up with this number, which is like average. And I think it's good enough in order to review um, the PRs. And yeah, this is basically like an example. Um, some processing stuff and what you should do, like in baby steps all already. I mean, basically, this code here is breaking the um, open close uh, solid principle. So basically, you have to modify this class every time that you want to add a new processor. And this is part of your domain layer. And that's why you need abstractions. You need to come up with architectures and, and restructure and rethink your approaches. And here, basically, yeah, this is, a, this is an example just for the sake of you know, showing how to do it in baby steps and how to be a good Boy Scout. So basically, you will create an abstraction here. And, and then you will have somewhere this bunch of uh, processors that are not going to affect the, your domain logic, which is the most important part of your code. Domain logic is what solves your problem. And so whenever uh, now you refactor your switch case, um, because I've seen in our code base, switch cases of, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 different options. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen that. Um, and yeah, in the end, yeah, you pay a price. So basically, you create your abstraction, um, and you add your processor somewhere else, and you don't have to change this logic anymore, because you're going to play around your, your abstraction. So that brings me to the fact number four, then. Um, you need tests. That's why, for me, it's like nowadays, it's part of our engineering process to write tests. It's not like uh, I remember back in the days uh, working for a tiny startup. It was a consultancy. And, and I remember was working on a code base for a bank. Um, and my, my manager said, all right, we're not going to write tests. They didn't pay for that. Um, OK. We're not. <laughs> so can I use if statements then? Did they pay for that? Um, so the thing is, like, you cannot nowadays uh, write code without tests. I mean, it's, it's your proof that your code is behaving as expected. And that's I, I wouldn't touch any code base without tests, because I don't know what's, what's going on. I don't know um, if I'm breaking something when refactoring it, right? And if it doesn't have any tests, just be like a game changer and write the tests. So th that's why it is very important, especially in big code bases. I mean, there is a constant refactoring and constant uh, changes uh, happening in your code base. So you need to run those tests and assert 
whether or not you break uh, stuff. And um, and that's important. That's why tests are important when it comes to technical depth. Uh, for me, technical depth is code, unreadable code, or code that hasn't been touched for a long time, or which is not consistent within your code base, or code that doesn't have any tests. For me, that's technical depth. Uh, yeah, of course, anti patterns and legacy code and abandoned code. So um, how we tackle technical depth, how we do it at SoundCloud then. We have it, something that we call technical depth rather. Uh, so we have regular meetings to address technical depth. It's very important for us to keep our code base consistent with the rest because of all the people coming on board. And we have, of course, a bunch of static analysis tools which tell us you know, which are the, the files that, for example, hasn't, haven't been modified for a long time and things like that. And what is the technical depth, rather? This is something that really works for us, and it's pretty important. I would definitely encourage you to introduce it, or at least give it a try, because uh, um, it basically consists of detecting those areas in your code base that cause a lot of pain, right? So here, as you can see uh, in this graph, basically we have a meeting, and then we say, all right, uh, let's write some posts, personal posts, post-its, uh, whatever. Um, and you're just going to uh, come up with some part of the code that you feel is very painful and it's very legacy. And then you know we are going to think all together where to put that functionality in our graph. As you can see, we have two, two x's. So the x axis consists of development time for that functionality. And the other one, the y axis, is like how much pain that causes. So let's say, for example, and these are real uh, numbers, and this is something that uh, happens in our code base. So basically, we have here dependency injection. We are not doing a good job with dependency injection, and we are trying to address the problem. So the thing is, it's very painful because we are still, I don't know, creating a big graph at startup time, um, and that's not performing pretty well, but it takes a lot of time. Right. I mean, it's very painful, but we need to rethink. We need to plan it out before addressing that. Uh, our data layer, it's, um, it's not scaling pretty well. Uh, we are considering um, modularizing our app, which means we are going to have like isolated functionalities. It, it fun every single functionality will have its own database. So we are, because we have still one huge database, and every time with migrations, for example, it's, it's, it's the hell. And we have a lot of issues with that. So here, what it's trying to tell us, uh, let's say logging, is something that's very painful. In our code base, logging is very uh, legacy. It hasn't been touched for a long time. So, so uh, it's not consistent, right? But it works. Sometimes you need to prioritize, of course. We are not perfect. And we couldn't. We didn't have enough time to to kill or to rewrite it. So basically, it's, but it's not hard in the end. So what it's telling us, all right, it's causing a lot of pain, but it will not take a lot of development time. So maybe it's something to consider. You're really um, killing some technical depth here, which is not going to take a lot of time. And you may you know, get a lot of good value out of that. So this is something I really like um, from our process. Um, fact number six. Um, this is, uh, of course, I, there's mixed feelings about this. Um, in my case, I think like uh, I don't try to think much about performance if it's not key for my business. I mean, if I'm developing a real-time uh, application, probably it's more key. But uh, I would say, like, first try to be. Uh, I don't know, try to write more readable code rather than, you know, getting into complexity because performance brings complexity too. Um, so, and if you have to tackle performance, you need to measure first. That's the first rule. Because sometimes you say, all right, I'm going to improve this, but basically I haven't measured. It's just like my feeling that uh, that could be improved. And, um, and in the end, you don't know. So we are we are actually developing developing inside um, 
a monitoring system for our app, so a real-time monitoring system. We're probably going to open source it. Uh, we are using our Prometheus uh, monitoring system, which is an open source uh, project. Um, but let's see what happens. Uh, still, like it's a work in progress. Um, of course, encapsulate complexity, as I said before. Always write code as the the other person reading it is like a serial killer and knows where you live. Uh, <laughs> so keep that in mind always. Uh, monitor it, of course. Um, fact number seven, then. Share logic and common functionality. At some point, your code base is so big that you need to break it down into smaller parts, especially if you have uh, other applications. At some point, we have the listeners app and the creators app. So we need a way to share code. How we do it? Uh, we have something that we call Android Kit. It's a very original name. So <laughs> contains all the Android stuff. Uh, that we share across our mobile apps, uh, let's say presenters and all these kind of things inherit from what is inside Android Kit. That brings us a lot of consistency, right? I mean, you either go to the listeners app or to the creators app, and the structure should be the same. Um, we have Skippy. Skippy is our music player. So it's a C++ library that we share across our mobile clients. So. Um, yeah, we use it for both iOS and, and, and Android. And we created a layer on top of that. Um, but it's the way to reuse code. Uh, like Cycle, like Cycle is a way, um, a good way to run out away from our um, Android framework. It's like how we um, trigger uh, activities and lifecycle events. Uh, sorry, activities and fragment lifecycle events two classes. So we came up with a like cycle with basically you inject, let's say, a presenter in a fragment and all that those callbacks that happen in the fragment are going to be uh, forward to to the presenter. So you don't have to deal with any Android code inside of fragments and activities. This is an open source library, so um, it generates code for you. So definitely something to keep in mind. And Propeller. Propeller is our attempt <laughs> to have a SQLite uh, reactive library. It has been under development for a few years. We always wanted to open source it, but still like a few, it needs more, let's say more changes um, in order to be out there. And, you know, companies like Square, they came up with better solutions. So we are still using it because it works and is very adapted to our requirements. But still, there's room for improvement there, of course. And something else, then, uh, fact number eight. You have to automate everything. We don't do anything manually anymore. Uh, we don't even have manual testing for our app. We rely on our acceptance tests, our integration tests, and our unit tests. We have around 6,000 unit tests, uh, I would say like 1,000 integration tests and 500 acceptance tests. So we don't, we don't do manual QA. Um, and we have a very mature continuous integration. Yes, so continuous building, yeah. Every time that you commit something, you get a new version. It's going to build, going to run all the tests, and it's going to deploy to our alpha program. A dog fooding, which is like using your own, eating your own food, uh, is very important. Always use your app um, all the time. And um, what are the lessons that we have learned so far? I just want you to wake up your curiosity. I would definitely love to catch up afterwards and exchange some knowledge and be more uh, specific in, in, in certain things. Um, but this is a bunch of lessons that I learned out of a scale in a big code base. Always wrap third-party libraries. I mean, you're not going to wrap RxJava course, but like when you have a UI library, just create a wrapper around it because it happened to us like a couple of times that those libraries are no longer maintained. And then you need to only change the implementation because you're working with contracts and abstractions. Um, do not overthink too much. Usually we tend to, as engineers, to come up with the, I don't know, the first generation architecture. And it's not always like that. I mean, uh, just 
iterate over that, start simple and move towards complexity. Um, early optimization is pretty bad for me. It's like I think, uh, again, we should think more about readability and consistency rather than um, optimizing your code till the limit. And trial error does not always work. I mean, if you have a true value and then you put it false, probably it's not going to work. Sometimes we tend to do that. Well, maybe if I change this flag to false, it works. But yeah, it's not always the case. Um, and divide and conquer. Usually when you are put a big problem, then we think, oh, how can I solve this problem? And then it's just about like starting very simple, very small, and then split it up and divide and conquer and move towards complexity and to the bigger problem. And prevention, of course, is better than cure. Um, these are the, some of the lessons learned so far within a, our code base. And um, and that brings me up again to the, I would say the last fact, which is work as a team. You can have like a very healthy and sane code base, but if you don't work as a team, you're going to have problems in the end. Um, I can show you how we organize our teams. We have platform tech lead. So this is a person that has a big picture over our Android app, and he knows about the needs as developers, which are the most painful areas in our code base. Uh, we have a core team. Again, it's like uh, I'm part of core team, and it's like things that are very engineering related. Uh, I'm not developing user-facing features. My users are all the developers, so I try to provide tools to them to make their life easier. I hope I'm doing a good job. Um, feature teams, of course, uh, related to features. Um, this is something that um, we we made a mistake in the past. I remember when I joined, I was developing user-facing features, and we were not enough mobile developers to cover all the feature teams need. And I ended up like working with three or four feature teams at the same time. There was a lot of context switching and working several with several product managers, um, which is yeah, it was a lot of overhead. Um, and then, of course, we have a testing engineering team, which cares about uh, our continuous integration uh, environment, and they provide tools to us, which is very important. I'm aware that not everyone has this luxury of having this team structure, uh, but that's something that you will have to have if you start growing in the end to make your life easier. This is how we organize uh, teams in a big picture. So we have two big, let's say, feature teams, playback and discovery. There is a bunch of features that each team covers. So it's like 10, yeah, I would say like 12 per people per team, both Android and iOS. Then we have, we work as a collective, of course. We have our collective meeting um, weekly to tackle problems, platform specific. We have our testing engineering, we have core, and we basically, we uh, talk most of the time with the tech lead. Uh, who has a clear view of what the needs of our code base are. Um, what else? Working culture is very important. We do a lot of pair programming. I'm not going to talk about like the benefits of pair programming, but 80% of the time we are pairing, and which means um, a lot of uh, knowledge transfer, and you get a lot of knowledge for free, and a couple of eyes, a lot of testing, and it's very nice. And we gamify that. I mean, there is a plugin for for Android Studio where you can, you know, score points, you know, depending on how many tests you write, and it, you, you can make it fun in the end. Uh, we use the Git branching model. Um, of course, we, we think that um, we face the same problems with iOS, so we definitely need to, to work together and in terms of architecture. Then the implementation could be different, but in the end, um, we are facing the same challenges. We are agile and flexible. I mean, we don't use any agile framework, but we can. Each team is is free to pick up uh, whatever methodology fits with them. And we have this collective sync meeting I talked about earlier. We have a bunch of processes when onboarding new people. We are pairing 100% of the time for two or three weeks with them. This person is going to be jumping between different teams. Uh, when it comes to hiring people, we have the 
pairing sessions, uh, well, the typical stuff. I can give you more details. If someone applies to SoundCloud, will be pairing with me. It would be nice. Uh, I'm not a bad guy, I promise that. Uh, we have the sheriff, uh, which cares about um, flakiness and acceptance. We use a release train model. So are you familiar with the concept of release train? So basically, release train is uh, we ship a new version of the app every 15 days, every two weeks. So that means that the train departs every two weeks. And if we put all the features that are ready, ready for production during that period of time, and if there's not something that is not ready, then you have to wait till the next train. And we are very strict with that. Um, because sometimes it's this kind of things like, yeah, we, maybe we can wait one more day and we just ship it. No, you should definitely try it. It's a better way of working. For me, it, it works pretty well, but you need to be strict with this. And of course, we use alpha for internal use, uh, which is dog fooding. Uh, we have our alpha program um, and where we, you know, we put non-stable functionalities or new stuff we are working on. Um, yes, what else? To recap, yeah, again, if your code is hard to work with it, just change it. No tricks there. Architecture matters, of course. Code evolution implies continuous improvement. You have to always constantly work on your code base and try to be a good Boy Scout and refactor it. Test, always test, please, please. I, you know, beg that you write tests. Um, tackle technical depth. Sooner or later, we have technical depth. We all have it, so we need to address it. Um, yes, again, code readability over performance, unless performance is key on your business. Um, share logic, break down your app into smaller pieces. Is They are way easier to work with. Automate, try to come up with a continuous integration environment uh, it takes time. It's not from one day to the other, but like over the time, you will definitely be grateful about it. And work as a team. Um, so my conclusion is, to be a good developer, you have to always use solid principles if you are doing um, object-oriented programming. Uh, if not, there's other principles related to functional programming too, but um, these are proven things, and they work. Um, and make it fun, and it's uh, there is a you know a one-to-one -one relationship that when you s you make things fun, you get things done. The more fun you have, the more things you get done, and it's true. Uh, if you're maybe pissed off, or maybe you're in the wrong place, or you're not doing something really right, um, again, I think that's uh, pretty much what I have to offer uh, for now. I just, I'm gonna be around and and I'm definitely want to catch up with you guys. So just ping me, we can actually pair whatever. If you want to dive deeper into more technical details, I'd be super glad uh, to do that. And if there is any questions. So we have a yeah, round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks. We still have a time for a question or two, but uh, sadly we have to empty the room for the next speaker, but two questions if, if we have two questions. So maybe I will start with the first one. How, uh, you, you said that your first release ended up not that good. Yeah. A and uh, I'm curious how it ended up. Of course, you, you, you fixed the bug, but how did it end up for you as a new guy at the company? I was not fired, which is... <laughs> but in the end, uh, yeah, there's a, this is the working culture about finger pointing. There was no finger pointing. I mean, we basically uh, fixed the problem. It was a phone call to say, or just, just increase the number of instances that we have for development, and we just kept the development version of our API for that. And of course, we had a retrospective afterwards. We learned out of that and learned how to not make that mistake again. That was the thing. I'm Easy. glad <laughs> to hear that then. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, thanks a lot. All and right. uh, we have to clear the room for next speaker. Thank you very much, and see you around there.